Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ryan Hicks, and I am joined today by a phenomenal panel of franchise leaders. And the topic for this short uh, but value-packed session is franchise relations. And to a lot of people, this may sound broad. It may sound obvious. Obviously, you want positive franchise uh, relationships uh, between you and your franchisees. But this is an extremely important topic and timely, especially as we're, we're all facing headwinds with the economy um, and with this pandemic. And it's a fact that uh, uncertain times create fear. Uh, they create strain. They create stress. And that stress is all aspects of business and life. So our goal today for this session is to give you some tangible takeaways that you can uh, take back to your brand and improve franchise relations. So I'd like to start by having each of our rock star panelists go ahead and briefly introduce yourself tell us who you are the organization that you represent uh the size of the organization your role and if you so please give us a fun fact about yourself um we'll start with you steve mr hockett quick introduction all right steve hockett i'm the ceo of great clips we're headquartered out of minneapolis we've got 4500 units Few of them haven't opened or reopened uh, yet from COVID. 1,100 franchisees. We operate 50 states in the U.S. and four provinces in Canada. And we're 100% franchise. We have zero company salons and, and we never will. Uh, fun fact is I'm from a small town in South Dakota. So I'm many times the first person from South Dakota anybody's ever met. So, Ryan, that's all I got. Beautiful. I've never been to South Dakota myself. What about you, Jesse Kaiser? Jesse Kaiser, I live in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I've got a little over 30 units between Sport Club Haircuts, Little Caesars Pizza, and OxyFresh Carpet Cleaning. We're located in, uh, we have brick and mortars in five Midwestern states. And uh, I guess a very interesting fact is at the ripe age of 44, I just had a five month old. Nice, congratulations. So you're, you're busy on the home front as well. Um, Scott Redler, what about you? Well, uh, I am from St. Louis, Missouri. Jesse, we share that uh, hometown and, and wonderful town. Live in Wichita, Kansas. And with Freddy's Frozen Custard and Steak Burgers, we founded it 18 years ago. I'm one of the co-founders and current COO. And we're still opening restaurants during the pandemic, opened many during the pandemic, which was crazy without dining rooms and very unpredictable. Uh, still having a lot of fun and Unusual fact about Freddy's, I'll make it that way, is that when we opened it, I've been in the business for 45 years, we thought we were only going to open one. And now we're getting close to our 400th location. Well, kudos on the growth, especially here during the pandemic, and kudos on, uh, on the 18 years. Um, for, for, the, for the content at hand, we're going to jump straight in. Um, first topic. Uh, this is kind of stating the obvious as we were just chatting before we came live here. COVID's obviously strained business relationships. Uh, it's certainly put franchisors uh, to the test as it relates to demonstrating value, providing help through the pandemic. So I'd like to ask each of you, and I'll start with you, Steve, what is, what's the one thing that you could recommend that's made uh, the single biggest improvement in your franchise relations and really what tactically have you done that's created a maximum impact and has been most effective throughout this very, very tough time? All right, Ryan, one of the things that we did early on, actually I've got a, a top 10 list of, of lessons learned. I'm not going to go through all 10, but one of them that we learned early on is uh, to to do video communication with the franchisees. I was never into video. I mean, I'm on Zoom calls. I've, I've been on six or seven platforms thinking, I love in person, but right now we've had to do video. So my president, Rob Goggins and I, we do uh, for months, we did a weekly video with the franchisees. Now we're to every couple of weeks, they submit questions, we answer them. Video is an awesome storytelling medium, just like what we're doing here today. And it has changed how we communicate with franchisees. I'll be doing videos now periodic for the franchisees for the rest of my time at Great Clips. It has made a huge difference. Got it. Any, uh, any others? You have a top 10. Any, any other uh, impactful things come to mind? 
Yeah, number uh, uh, seven on that list is make a few big decisions early and, and let the franchisees know we're in on them. Uh, we have never waived or suspended fees in our 38 years. We just don't believe that that's how you run a quality franchise system. Everybody pays the same thing, but we, uh, within a couple days uh, in mid-March, we waived fees, suspended fees, some of them out later this year. Uh, we also waived required salon operating hours. We had not done that either in our entire uh, 38 years of building a, a franchise system, but it gave, it empowered franchisees. It gave them the ability to react as they needed as the world was closing in on them with mandated shutdowns and closures. And so some of those big decisions early, Ryan, were really important to the franchisees to have them feel like we at Great Clips Inc. were in it with them. And that made a, a difference in building a bridge and saying, we're going to get through this by working together. Got it. And I'll kick it over to you, Scott. What say you in terms of uh, the one thing or maybe a, a couple of things that you could recommend that, that has had the biggest impact uh, for you and your organization as it relates to this topic? Well, you know, one thing is that we own 30, 30 corporate locations. And with 30 corporate locations, we were feeling everything and able to identify the issues and understood. I, I agree with Steve on the communication component. We've always had really wide open communications and by utilizing our franchisees to assist us with many things that we had started and realizing what the pandemic was gonna cause us to go through and how we were gonna to respond to get positive results. We utilize not only corporate staff, um, but our franchisees and we have a relationship that is great that utilizing people with the talent and skills on maybe someone who's done drive throughs even more than we have, which is a big area of improvement for us or escalating delivery programs faster than we thought we ever could or would and taking it to that level. But we did it as a team and it wasn't just corporate with an email or a, a saying, all right, now we're doing this. Well, let's get everybody's opinion. Let's all work together and we're going to come out better on the other side. And, you know, we're very fortunate. We're, we're running our, our year date comps are positive. Um, in business, uh, you're either lucky or you're good. And we're good at some things. We're very lucky. We have drive throughs and we realized that that was going to be a strength during the pandemic and needed to execute at a level that was far beyond what we've ever thought we could. Got it. And we're going to dig into uh, some of what you just said in a little bit more detail here in a minute. Uh, Jesse, I want to kick it to you. You're obviously the franchisee here on this panel representing multiple brands. Do, does, do you have any examples that stick out in your mind for how uh, either any one of your franchisors have helped you uh, throughout this time? You know, I, I think I experienced the whole gambit between all the brands uh, of different levels of support. Some I didn't see a whole lot of fee forgiveness. Some I saw a massive amount of fee forgiveness. Um, I saw some that were giving me, I mean, as soon as the IFA had some information, I mean, things were changing every day almost. Uh, as soon as there was new information, like regarding the PPP loans, uh, system-wide webinars, getting everyone in touch, the first round, but the second round's coming its way. So I experienced the whole gambit from that. Got it. Um, I'd like to ask each of you, and this is probably an obvious question, um, but folks are, you know, this is a tough time. W what do you think, I'll start with you, Steve, what do you think the single biggest obstacle kind of over the past six months, uh, again, I think it's kind of relatively obvious, but does any particular obstacle come to mind? And, uh, you know, obviously we're, we're working to solve challenges and crossover obstacles, but I'd like to ask each of you biggest obstacle over the past few months and, uh, you know, what, what were you able to do tactically to get through it or around it or to at least, as we keep using the phrase, uh, whistling in the dark, uh, because, uh, you know, nobody has all the answers and we're, you know, we're figuring this out, but what comes to mind for that, Steve? Well, one of the, our industry was, it's a personal service industry. And as, as Jesse knows, I mean, the social distance of a haircut by definition is zero. You have to touch the individual to give them a haircut. 
And so we were, uh, our industry was uh, dramatically impacted by government mandated shutdowns. I mean, there was just no room. There was no allowance for what, what can we do? And so our system collapsed. I'm sure Sport Clips did every other hair salon. And, and, and it really, it really was staggering how quickly these broad, robust systems just had to collapse down. And, and so of anything I'd ever prepped for in my life and here at Great Clips, I'd never had government mandated shutdown is one of those things that could really uh, set us back. And um, I will plan for one forever. So we work together, we work together with the industry and, and various people, the leadership at Sport Clips and their Great Clips were, were, were competitors, but we're good friends on how do we put together industry white papers to support getting our hair industry to reopen and uh, allow the states, uh, and we did it state by state, and we did it by province in Canada, to say hair salons have practiced great safety and sanitization for decades. We can do this with COVID. And so we worked together to make sure that uh, we could reopen. And so by April 1, we had 17 salons open out of 4,500. And then by June 1, we had, uh, we were back up over 3,500 open because we worked together um, and, and helped on behalf of all of our franchisees, whether it's Jesse's or the 1,100 at Great Clips, to really make sure that we tell the story of, of hair and why it can really thrive even in a COVID world. Yeah. Um, I'll kick it over to you, Scott. Biggest obstacle and uh, what comes to mind on, on that topic and how did you get through it? Oh, it's great. And obviously here was not my issue. I was okay with that. So thank you. <laughs> um, really tough between, um, between staffing and supply chain. And it really turned into more of a supply chain headache. Uh, all these distributors had all this product in their warehouses for full service and fast food and fast casual restaurants. Full service basically came to a standstill. So the warehouses are full with food that they have nowhere to send. And they weren't ordering a lot of products. So all of a sudden, wait a minute, we're still doing sales. Um, not at the beginning, we felt the same, you know, down almost 40% at the beginning, but then we grew very quickly to a reasonable number. Well, all of a sudden, they don't have the product because how do you predict something that has never happened to us before uh, for our distributors also? And then when you throw into that the fact that meat uh, plants were closed all over the country and some major players ran out of burgers. Uh, and so we had a game plan for that. We never ran out. We had some plans to stay supplied everywhere. And, but it was a challenge when, you, when you're expecting a certain amount of product to come in and you're trying to run a restaurant and you're ready to go and you can't get everything that you need. Absolutely a challenge, especially burgers when you have steak burgers in your name. Ryan, I think if I can jump in uh, with, with what Scott said, you know, we're totally different industries, but in this pandemic, one of the keys is, is he just articulated was you have to have an agile mindset and, and you, you, you got to try to think ahead and then you got to be able to shift and, mm -hmm. and do things differently. And um, being, being nimble is a great quality uh, in something like this that I know we will take forward and that agile mindset and, and being more nimble, even with the size of our system is something we will not lose at great clips. And it, the, this pandemic really reinforced that you got to be willing to quickly reset and then move in a direction to protect your brand, protect your franchisees and be there to serve customers. 100% agree. And, and very well said, Jesse, on your side of the house, um, what comes to mind? I know that we talked, I think it was probably a month ago, whenever we were on the springboard at home and, and you gave some really good insight kind of immediately where your mind went and, and what you were focused on and a couple of the brands. And obviously the pizza, the pizza business uh, is one that did well, is kind of set up, set up for that structure, but biggest obstacle on, on your side of the house and uh, what comes to mind there? Biggest obstacle right now is um, hiring. Um, so on the salon side, we're running into an issue where, you know, they're, my competitors are closing or they're reducing hours and the staffs are looking for work elsewhere. 
The problem is, is that uh, as long as it is the way it is right now, they don't want to cut hair. They're afraid. So they want to go get a job at Amazon and deal with cardboard boxes and not uh, a bunch of clients. So um, recruitment's always a challenge. It's not so much a challenge in the fast food industry, but it's not been as easy as it has. One thing that's changed is I don't have walk-in applicants anymore. Just don't. So if you think in the fast food business, it's not that many people that we get that apply online. They physically come in or they call, right? So all of our walk-in apps have have just dried up. So we don't have the same uh, number of, the pool is not the same. It's just not the same number of people to call upon to interview. So that's been one of the biggest challenges right now. And I don't really think it's anything to do with unemployment. I just think people's habits have changed and um, people are, are fine being sequestered in their home a little longer now than they were a year ago. Yeah. And so I would presume that all of your brands have uh, an advisory council, H- have the, has the advisory councils. And I know that Steve, as you just talked about being nimble. And so the, the ideas are coming from everywhere. It's coming from the team. Scott, you talked about the team as well. Um, but has the advisory council played a role and you know, what, what types of things uh, can, what types of things did you do to help through this situation, provide the folks like Jesse uh, in the audience, uh, the support. And again, I mentioned that nobody has all the answers, but do you have any practical advice around that topic of the advisory councils and, and have, have good ideas and tactical uh, execution resulted from leveraging advisory councils? Well, we, we do. And, um, you know, I think the way we have it set up, our country is set up into four quadrants and we have advisory franchisee from each group. And we've been strongly encouraging ideas and suggestions and actually making calls and asking for ideas. And, you know, what do you think? And we're all trying to get better. And as long as we're on the same page, it's going to work. And I think we've, we've enhanced the number of times we meet with our advisory council, even though it is virtual. Um, we're trying to make big decisions that sometimes cost a little bit to get done. And we want everyone's buy off to make sure we're turning right when we should turn right and turning left when we should turn left. And I think when you get everybody talking about it, the idea comes out as a better idea, the the team approach to it, and it's worked out great for us. Steve. Yeah, I would say the same, Ryan. Our uh, advisory council right now has 21 or 22 franchisees on it. Obviously, given our scale is is, is bigger than Scott's, so it, it works for us. Um, we engage them quickly. Uh, we generally have three meetings a year. They're all in person that run for a few days. That's how we use our advisory council. But in the COVID world where nobody's traveling, uh, we initially had calls every two weeks. Uh, then we stretched it out to every three or four weeks. And now go, this fall, we're going to six weeks um, in hopes next year that we can get back to our normal schedule. But the council has been uh, one, or we call it our, it's our marketing and advisory review council. So we, we don't, you, you, just a little different name, but it's the same thing. And they've come up with ideas that we've been working on. So that really just legitimizes what we do. We've come up with things where they've helped us rethink it. Uh, We've adapted some technology very quickly based on feedback from their role as franchisees. Uh, As Jesse said, the whole hiring, um, uh, you know, getting qualified applicants. And so our last meeting, there was a lot of back and forth and we've made some changes in um, how we're helping the franchisees uh, sourcing hairstylists and applicants. So yeah, I mean, that nimble uh, word that I used before in being agile, we, we've done the same thing with our advisory council. And uh, that's very helpful. You, you can't run with your head in the sand. You got to uh, have it up and the, and the franchisees can help bring that perspective. And, and we have tried to maximize that even more so here in COVID. Yeah. Jesse, one, one way I'd like to frame this for you is obviously we're, we're, we have headwinds everywhere. It's, it's just a weird time. And so there's a lot of talk about being nimble, which, is, which you have to be, and innovating and speed. And, and we've talked extensively about how initiatives that might typically take a year or 18 months to roll out methodically those are happening in weeks or months and uh, things are moving quick. 
And so, you know, have you experienced uh, some, some angst or frustration with franchisors rolling things out too quickly or, uh, you know, acting too quickly? Uh, and, you know, have you experienced fellow franchisees being resistant to some of the change that franchisors are really being forced uh, actually to do when they're listening to, uh, they're, they're listening to the franchisees, but it's tough to please everybody. Um, so what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on that? And how, what, are, what have you experienced? You know, uh, <clears throat> either myself or my brother sit on the advisory board for every one of our brands. So we, we get to see the whole spectrum. And just to circle back, uh, you know, I had one brand that didn't have a single advisory meeting the entire time of COVID. Uh, and they're doing fine. Like we're, we're up highest numbers we've ever had. So I, fine with that. Had another one where uh, we don't meet very often, maybe three or four times a year. And so we just did those over the phone. Nothing changed, just updates. Then I had another brand that, you know, we would have a monthly uh, phone conference call. And uh, that turned into twice a week in the very beginning on Zoom. And then broke out into all these huge task forces that uh, were for everything from uh, how do we get the stylist back in? How do we reopen the salons? What, what each state board standards are going to be different now? And uh, how, are we, how are we going to support the stores online more virtually? Uh, now we got to hold, deal with the sanitation checklist, things like that. And so uh, they, you know, Sport Club says in particular did a really good job with uh, getting the advisory council and then a couple other trusted franchisees to work with the corporate office. So the, the task force were 50% franchisee, 50% of the people that get a W-2 from the corporation and would be, you know, the executors of, of such things. We just helped come up with the ideas. Um, as far as resistance, um, you know, two of the three businesses were deemed essential for me. So mm -hmm. we didn't really shut down. We didn't really have to change a whole lot. Uh, obviously with the salon business, there was a whole, we had to shut down then we got to reopen up parcel capacity in some states, new rules, dividers in some, um, all types of things. As far as uh, the as soon as, as as far as the franchisees complaining or having resistance, I don't think anything was rolled out very quick because we sat still for four to six, eight weeks with nothing to do other than plan about reopening. And I think everyone was just so happy to be reopened. And then there was pent up demand for the first couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Everyone was so busy. I mean. We had record weeks in so many of our salons and then it slows down, right? And it's slowing down and it's starting to trickle back up. But, um, you know, after about three or four weeks after our reopening, we noticed a 20 to 30% dip in client counts over last year. Um, so those have been some of the challenges, but we haven't, we haven't had much pushback on any of the changes. Uh, and partly most of the changes have been, by the state board's uh, mandate. So at that point, you know, they're just like, you need to be compliant. Here's our national standard. This is our national standard. It covers about 85% of the state's standards um, up above, right? So if your state now belows, give an example, uh, masks are still required by our employees to be worn in sport clips. Um, I've got some states now that don't require it. And uh, we're still doing it it's just because it makes sense. And the surveys say the clients are more comfortable and feel safer when we're wearing them. So um, those are some things that I, you think people would push back on, but they just haven't. They just know that this is what we have to do to survive right now. Absolutely. So next topic is really more of a kind of a general leadership topic because th there was actually a quote on, on another panel and the quote went something like, nervous captain, nervous crew. And the question is, is how do you calm down the troops, especially in this environment, head counts are down, capacity is limited. Uh, people, uh, especially in the salon business are reluctant to come out and, and uh, from the employee recruitment side, there's challenges, but how do you instill a faith uh, throughout the organization that uh, you, you uh, keep your head down and, and things will come back to this. How are you leading through this and projecting, uh, projecting what you need to instill in the organization? Um, Steve, we'll start with you, sir. All right, couple things, uh, Ryan. Uh, one, uh, we've really uh, focused on single issue communication. And so rather than bundling together, having a weekly update uh, for the duration of COVID, 
we've been communicating with franchisees on single issue items. It's been uh, huge for us. It allows the message to get out without the confusion. Another uh, kind of leadership approach that I've taken with my team and then with the franchisees is never look back on a decision. So a great decision today might not be so great tomorrow. A great decision tomorrow might not be the best the next day, but never look back. You got to keep moving forward. You got to merge in with the speed of the situation. And once I settled in on that and realized that you make a decision with what you have on hand, and then tomorrow, if that changes, you got to keep moving and your franchisees will respect that even if you are changing the decision, if you have more data, more information, something new comes up, they respect that as long as you're up front with them and, and go back to that single issue communication. So I learned early on, no decision is a bad decision. You just got to keep making decisions. Got it. I really like the, this, the single issue communication because there's so much going on and things can get jumbled. So I think that's a really, really good point. I actually took a note on it myself. Scott, what about you? You know, I love the looking at this, we're used to dealing with business in a certain way. And leadership, similar to the Ryan, the line you use, you can never not lead. And we're used to going into business and going, all right, in two months, we're going to stop doing masks. And in three months, we're going to do this. And four, well, you know, COVID is, is the thing that is dictating time. And you have to be sensitive to that and honest with everyone. So really, we have taken it and gone, all right, here's what we have today. We can't plan for our Freddie's family reunion in April right now because we don't know what's going to happen. So let's make sure we make sure the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. I agree with Steve on single item topic. You know, we don't want to be painting the rail while the, the ship is sinking or even thinking about it. Who cares what color it is, right? We want to be focused on taking care of our guests. We have a term called the Freddy's way, doing things the Freddy's way with hospitality and food and make sure our, our all our decisions are driven to keep things going the Freddy's way first, and then we'll worry about everything else. And it, it's, uh, it's worked well. We, we just really like to try and focus on what's going to impact our guests, what's going to impact them positively. Let's take care of our team members. Um, and when we get the major items covered, let's take care of other stuff. For example, we've done bonuses for employees just because. And no reason, and because they're the ones that are out there in the restaurants every day, taking care of our guests and assuming risk. And things like that do make sense. And we, uh, we want to make sure we're taking care of the people that are keeping the ship afloat. I like the quote, keep the main thing the main thing, because that's the main thing. That's the headline quote. Um, Jesse, what about, what about you? Um, any feedback on that, on how you uh, keep the troops rallied and, and maintain uh, a sense of uh, a sense of direction through all this in your organization. You know, very early on, when the first uh, couple salons got to reopen, I went to those managers and said, "How you open this salon is going to dictate how our company does. So, if you get all your team members to come back, if you guys have great numbers, if everyone looks like they're having a good time and they're not scared." I get to open up all the other salons the same way because we're connected on social media. We've got a private Facebook group. I'm like, I need you to be vocal. I need you to be a cheerleader. And, and they did it. In fact, they even made some videos of pre-openings of this is what you should do in the salon before you open, or this is what you should do here. Um, and it just set everything at ease that by the time, you know, we were in five different States. So by the time the last state rolled open, I mean, they were just biting at the nails to get back in there and start cutting. There was no fear. Um, I, I mentioned on the past one, I was actually able to get 110% of my team back. So um, we did lose a couple. Uh, we took an opportunity to not bring back some people too, but uh, we hired a few and then we, we called in our hall of famers, people that had left us on good terms, went and did something else. And they realized the, gr the grass wasn't greener on the other side. So I really do feel like um, that first couple of weeks open, getting the managers uh, with that goal that not only does your store have to open well, but everyone else's does. And it's going to be all pending on, on how you're broadcasting that to the whole team. And uh, I'm very fortunate. I had managers that liked and wanted to take on that task. 
Love it. Jesse, a quick follow-up question for you, um, because I wanted to see if there are any unique ways that, that any of your brands have uh, facilitated or helped encourage the obviously best practice sharing is one of the great things about franchising done right, because you can leverage what's working in other markets. And so have, have there been any unique ways that, that that conversation has been facilitated or are there any informal or formal um, almost like mentorship type deals. I, I know that you can pick up the phone and call some of your buddies that operate different locations, but it, you know, outside of you doing that proactively doing it, do you mentor and help any of the other folks? And are there any, any ways that uh, your organizations are kind of facilitating the, the sharing of best practices? You, you know, a couple of the brands, uh, one, one brand in particular is they've got a Wednesday webinar now. Right. And, um, you know, look at the data. It's not the same people on it every Wednesday, but it, it's over half of the, the system. And uh, I mean, the guys at Corp and the ladies at Corp, they got tired of talking all the time. So they started bringing out success stories of, the, of other franchisees. Um, I've got COVID whiplash from it. I mean, it's just so much information. Um, and being on the advisory councils, I get to hear pretty much everything that's going to happen the week before. So, um, but I could tell you that that level of communication probably won't die down um, moving forward. I think that's probably one of the things moving forward is that there's more video interaction between the franchisor and the franchisee uh, in a structured format. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy about it. I think it's great. I also love that it's not required. Like if that Wednesday doesn't work for me, great. I've got things I got to do, but I do like the idea that there's, um, and it's not a two-way communication and the fact that it's like a Zoom meeting like what we're doing now it's uh, you get to listen and you can type in some questions. And the reason is because you got so many people on it, it'd be a cluster otherwise. But I think it's a great forum to get up-to-date information, especially for the average franchisee that has two or three units that's not involved in any subcommittees. I mean, this is way better communication than logging into an online portal or waiting for an email or something like that. It's just, uh, this is one of the positive things that's come out of this epidemic. Absolutely. And Steve, I'll flip it over to you and ask you the same question. Uh, are you guys facilitating and doing much of the same? And I would presume that you obviously have some of the same challenges that, that Jesse has mentioned on the recruitment side of the house. So do you have any formal, informal ways uh, where you're pulling together uh, folks and their focus specifically on those challenges or, and really just best practices in general how are you helping facilitate and encourage or how is that happening, happening naturally? Well, our franchisees, uh, again, without any company units, we're all about franchising. And so over the years, forever, we've encouraged franchisees to interact and to be connected and we facilitate that. So I know a lot of that is going on and that franchisees are, are friends with others and they're doing their own best practices. But of course, in our role, we need to facilitate that and so like it's been mentioned, uh, we've done videos when we, on the opening. Uh, a couple of the early franchisees, we did videos on, on what did they do? What did they see? What was the experience? How did they prep? Like uh, uh, Jesse talked about the managers. And, and as I said earlier, we've used a lot of video. Now we've got an ongoing series every week. We do a best practice of a franchisee. And, I, and it's, I'm not doing the the – the hosting like you are, I'm not the MC, but it's a various team. Some weeks it's a marketing, other weeks it's about staffing, other weeks it's even about real estate, how to take care of opportunities or take advantage, excuse me, of opportunities in this environment. And so we're hosting those best practices with franchisees and, uh, you know, some of the Great Clips Inc. staff that aren't just myself at the top. So it it's very authentic. It's subject matter experts and it's very well received. Viewership is awesome because like Jesse said, you can go back, you can watch it at 10 at night. You can rewatch it two days in a row if you want. And so that video storytelling will be with us uh, like it will a lot of people. It'll be forever. There's nothing better right now than video best practices. I agree. I agree. Um, Scott, anything else to add to the topic? You know, we do have a lot of franchisees that, uh, informally meet and talk weekly, which surprised us when we found out how many really do that. But the other thing that we shifted a bit 
going into you know mentoring and helping. We have 30 FBCs, franchise business coaches, that typically travel half their life uh, supporting franchisees and doing what we call operator assessment reports. And we put ourselves in the shoes of our franchisees because we kind of are one with 30 corporate locations and said, what kind of support or what can we offer? And we turned our FBCs into you know, calling restaurants and regional managers weekly. And when travel started again, instead of going out immediately and doing operator assessment reports and checking off the good, the bad, and, and we use it as support. To support our franchisees, what can we help you with? We're not here to fill, fill out a checklist for you. We're here to help you where you need it and make sure you've got the support you need to keep the machine running. Absolutely. Um, one question on the on the topic, uh, franchise development. Some people beat me up and say it's franchise sales, not franchise development. Um, but or, or actually, really, I think I, I would rather frame it in terms of of reinvestment. So kind of a first precursor question, Steve, if you don't mind me asking, if you look at kind of the whole the system as a whole, um, how many of the franchisees in your system are multi unit franchisees? And are you seeing uh, are you seeing a either Maybe a reinvestment's not the right word, but are you are you are are they growing their portfolio through this time for some of the single operators that are heavily hit? And just what's going on in, in that side of the house? Well, like we have eleven hundred franchisees, Ryan. So I've got franchisees that uh, have just come in and haven't opened up a unit. To the largest one has seventy seven. Um, we are uh, community minded. Uh, I, owner operators. Uh, we don't allow private equity as franchisees. We never will. And so we want people to have multiple units, but we aren't looking for really big. So our we're set up of a lot of franchisees that have multi units. If you've been in the business five years, you probably have six, seven uh, locations on average. Um, so are they going to be opportunistic? Yes. If they can get through, as Jesse said, hey, all of us customer accounts are down. Customers are cautious. But there, we Our franchisees are, are optimistic and bullish, and they will take advantage of opportunities. Uh, we want every franchisee to succeed and come through this. Uh, not, maybe not all of them will. Someone will decide, hey, I'm, I, just, I didn't like this business before COVID, and it's harder after COVID. I'm out. But we, don't, we haven't seen a lot of that yet. But uh, we, we think there's opportunities in our space to uh, grow the Great Clips brand as we come out of COVID, we just added a new franchisee today, another one a couple of days ago. So we're adding leases, we're adding franchisees, we're opening salons. Um, and so we'll keep growing. It rings at a muted pace, but we'll keep going. Got it. And we're winding down our time here. We have a couple of minutes left. I'd like to ask uh, each of you just kind of final takeaway advice. We have 300 uh, emerging franchisors right now. Uh, in uh, pods and learning in the reboot pods and, and they're getting tactical questions answered. But general advice, I'd like each of you, uh, general advice for, for these folks that are, that are here to learn and, and they're trying to get through this like everyone else. Um, we'll start with you, Scott. You know, um, I think the main thing to understand is our normal business decision process that we've been used to for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years is different. We are making decisions based on what is happening around us that we cannot control. So we need to be understand, I think nimble was a great word earlier, and understand the different scenarios that you might need to plan for. And as things change, don't be committed to going one direction or the other. Be free to change and, and try different things because some are gonna work better than others. Absolutely. Jesse, what, what say you? You know, if I was a franchisor of an emerging brand, uh, the thing I would keep top of mind is I've got a bunch of probably new franchisees, new to being a business owner. And this is a highly emotional time. And the only way you combat emotions is with facts and a steady hand. So I'd always be looking at the facts and uh, not necessarily blowing smoke up someone's behind, but just actually saying, look, this is what the data is saying. This is where it's trending. This is the good news. This is the good news. And uh, 
you know, the, the dark cloud though, um, is some people aren't going to survive this for one reason or another. Um, and maybe they just went out, maybe they're still cash flow and positive, but they just can't handle the stomach aches anymore. Uh, I think it's really important that a franchisor can help facilitate an exit strategy for the franchisee that's ready to get out. Uh, that saves the location, helps the brand. And honestly, it's the right moral thing to do. Some of these people get into this expecting X, Y, Z, and then something like this happens and not everyone's built for it. So just creating a, an easier way for those that want to acquire to acquire. I can tell you, I'm acquiring right now. I'm not building new. And the only reason I'm not building new is I still think there's several months before landlords wake up and they've got to start giving me cheaper rent. Um, but I'll acquire and I'll take over rents right now. Um, but yeah, that's my advice is just remember this is highly emotional, especially for the newbies in the, in being, uh, you know, a business owner. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective. That's awesome. And Steve, kick it over to you. All right. So I'm going to finish up Ryan with another one of my lessons learned and it is always helpful to have relationships and connections everywhere. It's kind of a hassle pre pandemic, but it will pay off in spades after any challenge like COVID. And the first couple months of this, we reached out and we uh, talked with law firms, accounting firms, banks, franchise finance providers, the IFA, industry suppliers, other associations, state cosmetology boards, our competitors. We were very close uh, with, with sport clips and many things as we were working together. So it ain't everybody, get your relationships going when times are good because then you can lean on them when times are tough. And, and even a system as large as us and uh, been around as long, we use that uh, and, and called in on relationships to help our franchisees get through this. And I'm, I'm really glad that we have those and that we can count on them and I'll keep working on building them going forward so we can use them. Beautiful. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for the time. Um, we're going to move over now to some Q and a, um, I think Steve's got to drop off because he is requested in another, uh, pod or whatever it may be, but we're going to go ahead and move over into some Q and a, and thank you so much, uh, everybody for the, for the time here in this general session. So, um, we're going to go ahead and draft some questions out there from some of the folks in, in the audience. All right, guys, so looks like we have a few questions come in. Um, first question uh, is really a combination of two folks. Um, Andrew asked, uh, and I'm probably gonna butcher the last name, uh, Andrew Gettig uh, asked a question around franchise engagement. I think it was when we were talking about the Franchise Advisory Council. Um, he was asking if all of the franchisees tune in uh, for, the, for the FAC meetings. And how do you reach the ones that never tune in? And then the second question was asked by an anonymous attendee says, um, many of our centers are very independent, which is good in many ways, but how do you get all the centers engaged with HQ? And how do you change the ways of the independent guys to get their engagement? So I'll kick this over first to Scott. What say you? Yes, well, um, I still, I would go back to the, 80% of the people do 20% of the work, 20% do 80. Uh, you can't get someone to engage that doesn't want to engage. And we found the trick is really using our, our custard console, our franchisees that are heavily engaged to communicate and get input and feedback and keep things on the right track. And we think that's worked great. It's somebody that doesn't want to get engaged, that just wants to do their own thing and, and operate by Freddie's standards, that's fine. Not everyone has to, so we're okay with that. Jesse, any any other thing to add? Yeah, just make sure the content you're providing is worth their time being in there. Um, and the effort of just totally trying to get all the new upfront information, it can be tough to make the information relevant again. And it's really tough. Like if 90% of what you're going to tell me in this webinar is what I heard last week, why do I, why do I try that? Why yeah. do I get in there? So just really make sure the information is new and it's worth them being on there. The other thing is um, don't be too discouraged that you don't have everyone on all the time. I mean, they're running their business. Uh, they've got their own personal lives. And the other thing too, and I know uh, Steve will, or Scott will uh, attest with me on this, they all talk. So if they couldn't make it, they're calling someone and saying, what did I miss? 
Um, and that happens probably more often than not when you're only providing 90% old information and 10% new. So just really focus on the content being worth their time. A hundred percent agree. Um, question from Marty Farrell. Uh, shout out to Marty. What's up, brother? Um, do you think franchisee satisfaction and validation has improved over the past few months? I've seen a lot of that um, throughout my clients that I work with um, because of the responsiveness, because of the communication and all the things that we've been talking about. But how do you think franchisee satisfaction is in your organization compared to a pre-COVID level? Uh, Scott, we'll start with you. You know, I think it's uh, it's strong. I mean, the some franchisees, franchisors have jumped in and made sure they're taking care of their franchisees. I agree with what Jesse said. Don't waste anyone's time. That's really a very important point. Um, and the franchisors that have jumped in said, all right, we understand what you're going through. You know, we, we've we done um, a fee abatement and, you know, tried to understand where they were and trying to make everyone succeed in a big, in, in the right direction together. And we think that's what keeps everybody and everyone happy. We don't have any, I mean, we're very fortunate. We don't have disgruntled franchisees. They know we're working hard. We're communicating with what we should communicate. We're not wasting their time as Jesse commented. Um, and as long as you're in that boat and everybody's on the same page and communication's open, you win. Yeah. Follow-up question for Jesse. And Jesse, if you wanted to add anything to that kind of from the franchisee perspective, um, feel free to do so. But the follow-up question from Peter for you, Peter from 1-800-PLUMBER, uh, he says, this question is for Jesse. He mentioned he's a franchisee of OxyFresh. I'm curious about his thoughts about franchises like this that are man in a van franchises with low service call tickets does jesse do you find that in franchises like that uh that more vehicles are required to make the investment worth it that's a very specific question okay so i think in our concepts like that most of the franchisees are owner operators and uh, they're not going to probably have the skill set, especially right off the bat, to manage multiple vans. And that's just the, the beast of it. Uh, for me, yeah, I had to get well over 10 vans before I started looking at some serious money. Um, but that's because I'm not running the business day to day. I've got to pay for a salary for a guy that's going to run the business, and that's going to get split out between all the vans and things like that. Um, but I've just noticed that th those uh, man of the vans are heavily owner operated mm -hmm. and, and that's totally fine. Um, but the multiple vans, those are going to be your, your, your operators, your, your big guys that aren't doing the carpet cleaning or the plumbing themselves or managing everyone. So that's just a different skill set. And, you know, your P and L is going to have to look a certain way that you could do that. And not every man in the van concept has a P and L that can support that. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, reminder for folks, use the Q&A if you want to submit a question. Another follow-up question on the topic, um, uh, the, the first two questions that we asked kind of around franchise engagement. Um, I received a DM that was a direct to panelist question that said, uh, at what point do you create uh, Franchise Advisory Council? And, and, and I guess this is probably more for Scott, obviously. Um, although Jesse, you, you sit on a number of franchise advisory councils, but are those, because we have a lot of emerging folks on, on the call, obviously, but are those franchise or appointed or how do you go about it? When do you set up the FAC and uh, how does the appointment thereof um, uh, unfold? Scott? Well, so we, um, we set ours up when we hit 300 locations and the way we filled it in was dividing the country into force and um, and then the franchisees themselves voted their representative on our franchise council. Now, prior to that, we have a construction council and we have a marketing team. So we're bringing franchisees in for both of those. Um, it's been very helpful for us and surprising in a lot of ways. Um, we always think we're trying to watch every dollar to make sure we get value with everything and our franchisees want to make sure that we're protecting the brand and doing things the Freddy's way all the time. So it really does, uh, some of the info we get has been really, really enlightening. Got it. Jesse, anything that you would want to add to that? Oh yeah. Uh, 
I'd ask one simple question. What do you want to achieve with your franchise advisory council? If you're wanting to uh, sell out your guys' ideas, they need to be elected. Um, but if you're wanting legitimate uh, contribution and collaboration, you might be better off appointing your franchisees uh, because it's a popularity contest when they go for elections. Yeah. I just want to make a quick note as Jesse's obviously busy and he's staying with us and spending time. So appreciate, appreciate the time. And uh, it's, it's really appreciated. Um, a follow-up question from Rosie. Um, what conversations, and I think this is more general, it's on the topic of landlords. What conversations are people having with landlords as to rents and lease guarantees if they had to close? Um, either of you have any uh, feedback on that question? I personally have been fortunate enough that I haven't had to close any any locations during the pandemic. I could tell you most of my landlords were just like, pay me rent. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot. I did get a couple, hey, uh, if you need a month or two put on the back end of your lease, we can do that. Um, but I didn't get a whole lot. And I could tell you that when I'm coming up for my renewals, um, the best I'm getting right now is no bumps uh, where there was a bump in the arm. Um, I'm seeing it better with new construction now, but it's still not where it needs to be. It's still very low, but uh, I don't think landlords have woke up yet. Got it. I, I agree with that all the way. And, and we're a landlord for some centers and we were very, uh, basically let someone take two months and add it to the end of next year or whatever. Uh, we want people to succeed and stay in business. But I think Jesse's right on. It, um, it hasn't hit them yet. When you start seeing some of the big players going bankrupt that have big leases everywhere. Um, the number of open buildings are gonna increase and supply and demand are going to fix it for all of us. Beautiful. Um, Jesse, one of the things that you briefly mentioned it uh, whenever we were uh, kind of in the early stages of the panel, um, but on the topic of recruitment, you mentioned that was one of your biggest challenges. I know that when you and I spoke about a month or so back um, you talked about uh, getting 110% of your folks, uh, uh, employees back kind of in that original, original um, time period, if you will, whenever you were reopening, because what you did is you went and you re-engaged uh, employees uh, from the past. And so I just wanted to invite you to add any more color to that and then add anything to the topic of recruitment, because there's a lot of folks out there struggling with re recruitment for all of the obvious reasons. Anything else? that you would like to speak to or add to that? Yeah, I don't know if people are necessarily working for money. The only people coming from a retired sales guy. I mean, I think sales people and the sales reps on, on this call are gonna be the, the ones yeah. that are gonna understand this. That I think sales people are the only ones that are able to articulate, uh, if I have XYZ in income, I can do XYZ with my life. Uh, everyone else on this planet just wants XYZ and they can't make that transition. So. When you're recruiting, you've got to be able to communicate what the vision of working with your team is actually going to be like, uh, because that's going to attract people and give you a differential. So whether it's the culture in your store or it's uh, your long-term plan to keep them, or maybe, uh, and I have this in my company, I have a philosophy called up and out. You're moving up in my company or you're moving out. Like you've got to go up. So if I don't have room and a pyramid has got, it's smaller at the top than it is at the bottom. If I don't have room for you to move up, you have an obligation to go find another job, go do that. I'm going to develop you nonetheless because I know at the end of the day, the grass isn't greener over there and you're going to come back to me with more experience and you're going to move up in my company nonetheless. So that, you know, that's been my strategy is we're going to develop you whether you're here for a year or 16 years, we're, you're just going to get developed. That's what we're going to do. And so that's been one of my differentiators. So, you know, what, is, what are you guys good at? That's the question. What, when you have employees, what do they say they like working with you guys about? Excellent, excellent advice. I love the philosophy up and up and out or uh, however, how you frame that. Um, but gentlemen, thank you so much for the time. I've got a couple of announcements as we're gonna move over uh, into doing the pods. Um, so first, if you're participating in the relaunch mentor sessions in the pods as we did yesterday and they were phenomenal you need to have the zoom desktop client so go ahead and 
make sure that you're logged in from your computer. There's a link in the email that you receive with the agenda and it shows you where you can download that. We have a number of folks that tried to call in, but you need the desktop client. So go check your email or look in the chat box. We'll put it there um, so that you have that. And then the uh, second uh, announcement, these shirts are really awesome. This is some phenomenal swag. The material's amazing. It's not too late to submit your before and after photos so, or before and after videos. Um, we'd love to encourage everybody to submit those. So after this session, change into your shirt for the session on the back side of this panel. Um, as you noticed yesterday, it took 10 or so minutes to get everything facilitated. But uh, that's because on the back end, we're, we're, we're matching everybody into the right pods. So um, if you need to go hop and change into your shirt, do it now. It could be a shirt from past springboards or it could be this shirt. And then um, speed back over and we're going to go into the mentor pods. And uh, gentlemen, thank you again. And uh, we'll see you in the pods.